Brilliant. Okay. Well, welcome back after that short break, which um, is always good to uh, be able to stretch and uh, rediscover that you've got ears. Um, our third uh, presentation comes from uh, Ioan Dunescu from Romania. Uh, Ioan is uh, a professor at the University of Bucharest and is a leading uh, professor in the field of uh, social work and specializes in uh, probation. I'm going to hand the floor straight over to him and ask him to do his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. I'm always uh, uh, over flattered by your uh, introductions. I don't know how to react to that. Um, just, uh, I will just go straight to the point to the presentation without making any comments. I, I prepared a, a very brief presentation for two reasons. One, one reason is that, uh, you know, as a, as a professor, I cannot even work in the park without a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, <laughs> and the second reason is that uh, uh, I hope that this will structure my presentation a little bit better so you can, um, uh, you can see what are the, the main points that I wanted to make in my, uh, in my paper. Uh, as, uh, I don't know if you can see this presentation properly. Can you see it? Yeah, everything is okay? Yep. Very good. Um, um, the, the, the presentation is made from um, uh, looking at the community sanctions and measures in particular, or uh, I would like to say from the probation perspective. And uh, obviously it's based on my personal experience uh, in this field uh, and also on some literature on uh, penal policy transfer where, uh, where um, uh, Rob Kenton was very active. Um, okay, some preliminary observations about the international development from my perspective. Um, I would like to, to start by saying that the development of community sanctions and measures or development of probation in Central and Eastern Europe, I think in the last 20 to 30 years is the most significant novelty in the criminal justice uh, system, uh, as far as I, I see. Uh, in the Western Europe, a lot of uh, deep organizational transformations took place in the last uh, uh, 20 to 30 years ago. We have, we have transformative rehabilitation in England and Wales. Uh, we have the amalgamation in different countries like in France, uh, Croatia and so on between prison and probation. And we also have um, uh, joining probation with uh, services for juveniles in Italy. So a lot of uh, a lot of transformations also in the probation services in the uh, in western part of, uh, of Europe. Um, again, many transformations uh, took place also in the competencies of probation services and also in ideology. Uh, you see more and more work with uh, violent extremists in some countries like in, uh, in Belgium, for instance, or in France. You see uh, more interest in, me in mental health in countries like uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and so on. But besides this uh, huge diversity, we can also see some kind of uh, commonplace, like for instance, uh, an interest in the risk needs responsibility model. I think everybody speaks in, in Europe now about, uh, about uh, risk assessment, about criminogenic needs, about responsivity. I'm not sure to what extent these principles are really implemented into practice uh, with accuracy, but uh, uh, nevertheless, they, they, uh, they, they become part of the ideology, a new ideology, a new narrative of the probation service in Europe. Uh, apart from that, we, are, we have more and more ticking box, uh, boxing culture. We have more and more forms that probation officers need to, to fill out. Uh, we have uh, a lot of managerialism. We have a lot of electronic monitoring. Actually, the, uh, especially in the new, in the new countries, electronic monitoring took over uh, the, the probation. The activity became the core activity of the probation service in uh, in many countries. Turkey, for instance, uh, you have hundreds and thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, of cases of ele on electronic monitoring without any other uh, intervention. But we can, we can also uh, see more and more interest in uh, uh, human rights standards and uh, in different uh, uh, aspects that belong to this uh, human rights uh, agenda. Uh, champions for this change process, in my view, are the Council of Europe and the European Commission. The first one, um, 
uh, were the drivers from the political and technical uh, perspectives. The Council of Europe, for instance, uh, adopted several recommendations, uh, and of course, uh, the European uh, probation rules are the, the most important ones. Uh, they also provided technical assistance, a lot of conferences, uh, expert meetings, uh, platform meetings, and, uh, and so on. So they provided a lot of information uh, about you know, how probation should be developed and how the probation practice should be run. Uh, European Commission played a more pragmatic and financial uh, role, especially in the Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, in the pre-accession and the transition uh, period, uh, we all remember the FAR projects and uh, other projects like that, that were financed by the Euro European Commission to uh, discourage or to decrease the number of prisoners and uh, uh, develop probation services in, in this part of, uh, part, part of Europe. Um, as, as somebody said, uh, these two organizations, Council of Europe and the European Commission, together played a, a, a huge role in the penal policy uh, transfer. Um, but in the last, let's say, 10 years, we see more and more um, organizations or countries interested in, uh, in disseminating uh, knowledge and expertise in, in this field. We see Norway and Sweden we, uh, Norway uh, has this uh, mechanism, uh, Norlau, uh, and Sweden, they, they use SIDA quite a lot in uh, promoting uh, these ideas, uh, especially at the periphery of the European Union, geographically speaking. Uh, for instance, uh, Norway was very active in, um, in Moldova, in the Ukraine, uh, and Sweden uh, are, uh, is more and more um, uh, active in uh, even in countries like uh, in, in Africa. Uh, strengths and weaknesses in my uh, in my opinion for for this kind of uh, dynamic um, were the strengths to start with uh, were that um, uh, the development of probation in Europe in, especially in Central and Eastern uh, Europe was incredibly um, uh, dynamic uh, due to this kind of exchange. Uh, in, in some countries, probation service took like 100 years to, to develop as, as it is now. But there are countries like in Croatia, where within five years, they already reach a point where they, they have already a mature probation service. Uh, Slovenia is another uh, example like that. So they, they uh, avoided to waste a lot of time and resources. They avoid, uh, avoided to, to make uh, the same mistakes uh, as other countries in the past. So they they have fully fledged probation services within a few years. So this is a, a major strength, uh, uh, I think. When it comes to weaknesses, I think, unfortunately, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, the, a lot of penal policy transfers took place based uh, on this uh, coping strategy, uh, where uh, different mechanisms, tools, programs, or even institutions were copied from one place and transplanted, transplanted to, to another without proper adaptation or without any cultural sensitivity or whatever, uh, or, you know, things like that. And uh, I just gave a few examples, uh, for, uh, for instance, uh, risk assessment tools. You can see the same risk assessment tool in, uh, in Bulgaria, like in, I don't know, in, in, in England. You can also see probation order in Bulgaria, although uh, probations, uh, uh, Bulgaria belongs to the civil, uh, civil law tradition where they, they, they use quite a lot of suspended sentences rather than probation order. So there are some, uh, let's say, uh, not very good examples of how the, how the, the, the penal policy can, can really work. Uh, another weakness, I think, is, uh, is um, the fact that most of these projects uh, were time limited. Uh, and once, some, sometimes once the projects uh, ended, uh, the, the idea died. Uh, and I have a few uh, examples in mind, like uh, COSA, the Circle for uh, Accountability, um, uh, developed in the uh, United States, but then in, in other countries, including Netherlands and, uh, and England. Uh, some Central and Eastern European countries uh, tried COSA uh, based on projects 
Uh, but once the projects uh, ended, uh, COSA disappeared from this part of the world. The same goes with other examples, like um, uh, another another good example, I think, is uh, the use of uh, different uh, management uh, models, uh, excellence model in in, um, in management. Again, it was introduced in some probation services, but disappeared after a few years uh, after the projects uh, ended. So this is another weakness, I think. Uh, the sustainability was not uh, always a very good uh, uh, dimension of this uh, project. Conclusions, I think we are living increasingly uh, in a complex and multi uh, multi-polarized uh, world, including in Europe. Uh, I think we have a lot of voices in Europe when it comes to uh, expertise and power. Uh, we have many, many jurisdictions that are now involved in this kind of um, uh, technical exchange, knowledge exchange at the European uh, Union level. Uh, as I mentioned already, Norway, Sweden, but also Netherlands more and more uh, are, are involved in this kind of um, uh, assistance, technical assistance uh, uh, projects. I think in the future, uh, Council of Europe and the European Commission will continue to play a significant role in uh, harmonization. And um, I gave a few examples in, in my paper on, on how the, the existing framework decisions or the green papers on different issues uh, uh, contribute to, to a greater harmonization uh, in the penal field, even if the the, 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 the legal framework is not very clear in this respect. Uh, countries are still uh, holding their uh, sovereignty over this kind of field, but nevertheless, there are developments in the, in the direction of harmonization for obvious reasons, for cooperation, for security, safety, and, and so on. Um, I think we can... Um, we can uh, we can see more and more innovation in uh, in Europe in this uh, in this respect. Uh, I think we see more and more technology used uh, not only in supervision but also in training. Uh, for instance, I I learned about a, a very interesting innovation in, in in Netherlands where the training can take place using different games and uh, exercises that uh, uh, are actually can be made uh, remotely without the, the trainer being in the room. I'm not uh, yet convinced uh, by this kind of uh, approach, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this kind of development is out there and probably will be uh, continue in the, in the future. Uh, I, one of the questions that um, uh, attracted my attention uh, from, the, from the script that uh, you sent us, John, uh, was how England and Wales will uh, will participate in this uh, dialogue, especially post uh, Brexit. And in my opinion, I think England and England and Wales will will be able to continue to play uh, an important role in Europe uh, in terms of the development of probation, uh, especially if if uh, it will continue to invest in uh, innovation. And in this respect, I think universities are really really core resources. Universities in, uh, in England and Wales have very good, strong traditions and uh, a, a lot of potential to, to innovate in this field, to produce uh, evidence on, on what works or uh, the systems or you know, other uh, dimensions that are really uh, useful for, for the probation development in, uh, in Europe. Um, but of course, they, um, I think funding is also uh, uh, important and uh, the former DFID or the existing Ministry of Fi uh, uh, Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs, I think they also ca can play a, an important role in supporting this innovation to travel to, uh, to Europe. Uh, again, I think England and Wales can uh, continue the membership in the international organization or regional organizations like CEP. And this, is, this can be a good platform where ideas can be debated and uh, uh, obviously we hope that England and Wales will continue to play uh, an important role in, uh, in the knowledge production and dissemination. Thank you very much. I hope I was uh, within time. Well, not, not quite, but thank you very much, Johan. It, it was uh, good to have your contribution. Uh, Sale from uh, uh, New York. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is perhaps 
broadened the discussion. Uh, we've had European organizations mentioned, and I wondered from a United Nations uh, perspective, uh, do you see the UN uh, having an important role to play, uh, particularly post COVID, uh, in driving uh, just, uh, justice reform? John, thank you for asking. I'm probably not uh, entitled to speak on behalf of you, and so it's my personal, it's my personal opinion, of course. So as I see right now, as I'm still new in UN, but as I see right now that uh, the role of UN in this particular uh, initiatives and developments will be developed and strengthened. As you know that uh, UN started a huge reform and it seems like it started like two years earlier than all these COVID situations started. And it seems like it started, you know, in the right moment and it is still developing the reform and the process are really changing. So I think that the role will be really, you know, growing in terms of criminal justice reforms and uh, taking in mind there are so many uh, changes happened within uh, last half of the year, including some dramatic change in approaches countries are using in terms of how they deal with prison population, mm -hmm. uh, what happened with probation services uh, during the lockdown restrictions, and uh, how generally uh, the priorities of the countries has changed mm -hmm. in terms of you know uh being more uh more interested in uh public health and uh, uh you know, restructuring of national budgets and change of developing budgets as, as well because this this was like huge you know budget support and uh, financial support for many countries in the developing world so I think that uh, what we can expect is a few change overall within the criminal justice system and within the main actors who are currently available on the scene. And um, I fully agree with all predictions which we have heard today. Uh, and uh, I really believe that uh, uh, we even Probably right now, it's very difficult to understand what happens within the next half of the year or within mm. the next two years, mm. taking in mind how rapidly this is developing, the, the, the whole coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, and the, the reaction of different uh, member states. Uh, so we still are in the process of, I think, in the process of understanding and scoping and mapping the how huge this uh, uh, pandemic influenced uh, the not only the public health system but also the criminal justice and overall governmental structure. I believe that even the the, the police, you know, crisis which we have discussed during the first part of the today workshop, even this uh, happened uh, on the background of everything what happened with COVID-19 in, uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, and uh, I imagine that similar, you know, circumstances may happen in many countries. Mm. And, uh, we can see from different countries where police uh, reform was discussed, we can see almost everywhere that the public opinion was like worse than it was it was changed so rapidly and so unexpectedly it, if you remember the the period when we worked for eu project eu and bill was leading on this work with police if you remember it was a case then uh the the famous sportsman from kazakhstan was killed on the street and uh this case has suggest has you know started uh has started a uh, dramatic movement around the society and there were lots of you know uh, similar uh, similar events which is happening right now in the u.s and uh, what is interesting that the uh, 
this this change in in public perception of police is happening very rapidly mm. and regardless how strong is the government or how how open is the government for discussion so we can i i think we should expect the similar similar situations in many countries which are currently having uh real troubles with public health situation because all these layers they come together mm. and what we see right now in the us may may be repeated in many countries and i think the con the connectivity of the agendas is i think is a very powerful point but also the speed of which one agenda affects the another uh, is yeah. well made would anybody else like to pick up um the the reform agenda that uh Yuan was was talking about uh, thank you nick yeah can i i i guess it's a, a question more than a comment um to Yuan about um the council of europe and the european commission and their utility in terms of uh, supporting change and reform and um, whether you have sort of good examples of where they have proved an ally and indeed others maybe where where they've been less um, useful um, uh, you know I have a number of reasons for asking but I think I get the sense that they are a, an underused resource or an underused route by which to either help change take place or indeed ensure that it stays changed if you see what i mean you want, do you want to pick that up yeah, yeah of course um well i, I have a, lo a lot of good examples of uh, how council of europe and the um, uh, european commission influence changed in uh, in in central and eastern europe in uh, countries at least i have to say that um, at least the European Commission was really instrumental in developing probation service uh, in, in many countries in, in this part of Europe, including Romania. Uh, and also Council of Europe is continuously playing a very important role in uh, promoting uh, high standards of practice and human rights and, um, and expertise and so on. So I, I think there are many, many good examples uh, of, uh, of this kind, but uh, to some extent, I think Going back to the to the communication strategy that we mentioned earlier, I think we are not always very good in in you know showing these uh, examples, showing these uh, good practices. We don't know how to explain to people uh, what these institutions did uh, or uh, are doing even now. So um, I think we need to work on that. How to to make these uh, examples known better. I think that's something that we can work more on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else like to pick that up? Uh, Anna, thank you, Anna. Yes, thank you. I want to mention something uh, regarding communication, language, and also because uh, Johan's presentation makes me think about it. Um, thank you very much, Johan. As you can imagine, I found your presentation super interesting and also very familiar at the same time. Uh, you did very well, you explained. You, actually, I have to say that you had a very good communication strategy, presenting very good what is the Council of Europe, the um, <laughs> European Commission, so you did it very well. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to say that it's very interesting to be involved in international exchanges and that now more and more countries want to be involved in these exchanges. I also highlighted that in my article and also in my presentation, but there is something that I did not mention and I think that you already mentioned, but it's important that I highlight it again. From my perspective as a woman from Barcelona working in an international organization, I have to say that the language issue is a difficulty, a really huge difficulty. And this brings me to the question that was raised at the very beginning of this meeting and related also to the communication strategy. 
in countries where less English is spoken or where there is a difficulty in communicating in English, although their intervention programs, activities, projects are excellent, and those activities could be a very good examples to be shared, they will be always be more reluctant to participate. And this causes exclusion. And this does not promote ownership, access, participation, and so on. Uh, of course, from the organization where I work, we always try to involve all the different countries' perspective, but this is especially difficult when you work with an international environment when sometimes it requires from you um, uh, a very uh, well use of English. And of course, it requires also a bit of uh, patience from the English speakers uh, side to understand your own language spoken from very different accents and very, yeah. Yeah, so this is a bit what I wanted to share with you. Okay. Um... We, we're slightly constrained for time. So could anybody indicate who would like to come in next, please? Uh, any more contributions on the Yuan presentation? Because, oh, uh, Yuan wants to come back. You are gonna have a final word, I promise you. Um, um, so let's pass to Yuan to have uh, his uh, wrap up. And then we're going to pass over to Rob Canton. So Jan, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was just uh, thinking the other day and I'm, I'm very happy to see Saul here with us. And I think it's, it's also linked with, uh, with, uh, to, the, to the presentation that I made uh, uh, today. I think we focus too much inwards. We focus a lot on what's going on in Europe as if Europe is the only place where, where we can develop things. Yeah. I think we, we need to, to start uh, uh, learning more from other places and looking outwards, like, you know, looking to what's going on in Japan or what's going on in, 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 uh, in Malaysia and in uh, different parts of Australia. I, I heard a, lo a lot about a, a very interesting examples of good practices and good, good mechanisms of reintegration in the community. Even in the Middle East, some practices are really fascinating. Of course, they, they might, might or might not be relevant uh, or useful everywhere, but they can be adapted. They can be, uh, we can learn from all these examples. And, uh, um, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit frustrating for me that for prisons, we have prison brief where you can see everything what is going on around the world in terms of you know prisoners, uh, structure, dynamics, and so on. But when it comes to community sanctions and measures, we have only uh, space too uh, in Europe, but we don't have data about what's going on elsewhere. And I think here is where United Nations can really uh, do something to help us build up this kind of international uh, dialogue uh, in order for us to have a broader picture of what's going on in the, in the world. Uh, a sort of prison brief, but for probation could be a good example to start with. I know that United Nations is now thinking about uh, reforming or updating the Tokyo rules. This could be a good, a good opportunity for us to, uh, to, to learn first what is going on. How, how are these community sanctions and measures developed around the world first? And then to, to change the rules. But this is just a, a suggestion. Well, it's a powerful suggestion and one that's going to shape our life. Um, we've come to the end of our three presentations. So thank you very much for listening. If you want to find us, we're on criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on INTCJ Network. And thanks for being there, everybody. And that's the bit that gets recorded and pushed out. And hopefully people will find that of interest. I'm going to pass the baton over to, to Rob. We will keep recording this so that we can hold on to uh, the feelings about how this, these two initial seminars have worked. We've got a lot of learning to do. Our plan is to ask you to put some reactions and feedback in writing, but Rob is also going to uh, take us through some discussion points. So over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to be very disciplined because time's against us. And I'm just gonna take two minutes to comment on some of the principal themes that we've been discussing this afternoon. Um, 
one is I think the importance of institutionalizing change. Um, uh, Jan spoke about it at the end about little sustainability and Nick raised it in the first place. How do you embed things so they don't backslide? Nick spoke about the importance of an evidence base, but what if the evidence doesn't even exist? Um, and in some countries, equality data, for example, is not even collected. And this, I think, can lead to Jan's point about how there is um, inappropriate copying, because what we know is, is in, inappropriately or insufficiently uh, contextualized. We spoke about the importance of legitimacy, the limitations of imposing reform from above. You need to embed it and have it owned by a workforce. We spoke about legitimacy and how a code of ethics might be able to contribute to ethical practice. Nikki raised a number of invaluable points. One we didn't have time to develop was the, the theme of corruption, which she encountered in Africa. And perhaps one could generalize from that to talk about those vested interests that oppose an ethical dissemination of practice in the way we're describing. Nikki also said, in fact, perhaps I can say that Rob Watson has elegantly summarized something that Nikki said that's really important here on Twitter. The loudness of our voice does not reflect our needs to be cared for and treated with respect in the criminal justice system. Nikki Woods makes the distinction that gender-based issues are an endemic issue in criminal justice. Terribly well put, and thank you for that, Rob, and thank you for the, the thought in the first place, Nikki. The importance of communication and the recognition that not everyone is similarly placed to act either as a speaker or as a listener, and that these things are gendered and that, uh, as Anna pointed out, uh, the absence of uh, role models for, for women uh, in communication means that there is a, a risk of persisting uh, the way in which women are so commonly overlooked in agendas for change. For me, those were some of the most important points to come out of the seminar. And I don't, I wanted to say them before they get lost, but I particularly wanted to share with you finally some, uh, points of evaluation. John will be sending out a questionnaire, as he said, but I would like to put just this, put this up on the shared screen, if I may. And that is this. Is that now working? Can you see this? Yeah. This yeah. is a rather tried and maybe a little bit weary way of um, summarizing uh, some of the uh, things, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. These are some I listed for myself. And uh, that can be made available if you like. There isn't really time for us to talk through these or to add to them in the way that, that, that I'd hoped. But I think um, I, I'd like to say that for me, both these seminars have been really enjoyable and that's a good start because if people don't enjoy themselves, they will not return. I think we've touched on some of the limitations so far. We have, there are some terribly important topics that we haven't really been able to do justice to. And as was said at the very end, it's, there's a risk of it being too Eurocentric. We need to look at other parts of the world as well. And Saleh's participation here will greatly enrich that network. We've got a lot of capacity, a lot of talent, a lot of connections. And if we can begin to secure projects and succeed, um, we maybe have the opportunity here to flourish. But I think we shouldn't overlook some of the, the, the threats that we have here. Do people want another network? There are networks that exist already. Where does ours fit in relation to those? How easy will it be able to gain funding? And notwithstanding Jan's optimism that Brexit may not disadvantage England and Wales contribution, uh, there's still some concern about that, particularly with regard to the, um, the, the, some of the doors that will be closed after Brexit because of funding. Um, that's just something to share with you all. And maybe um, if you have time to complete the questionnaire and send it back to John, then uh, that could be a framework if you could add to that, if there are any conspicuous omissions, things that you would like to add to that. Though I don't think that's something that we can do for now. So at that point, I will stop sharing. We have a minute to go. John, it's back to you. I think it's your privilege to, to say the very final word. Okay. Um, we don't know where this network is going to take us. What we do know is that we had an image in our uh, minds of rolling up a snowball uh, and then letting it go down the mountain to see what ideas uh, it would gather. Um, 
thank you very, very much for joining with us. Um, with social media, um, we believe that by putting quality material out online, both in written word, uh, the spoken and visual uh, presentations, um, we can do some important things. We're going to wave goodbye to Nick, but shortly we'll be waving goodbye to everybody else. Um, because one of the things I think is important is that we don't steal time. So um, on behalf of uh, the four of us who are the planning group, so that's uh, Rob, uh, Dave, uh, Rob Canton, uh, that was the first one, Rob was Rob Watson from uh, Rob Canton, Dave and myself. Thank you very much for putting the intellectual energy into this, but also giving us the support by, by showing up. We really are grateful. Uh, we will be reviewing this over the next few weeks. And our strong hope is that you've laid some foundations here that you and your colleagues will be able to build on. And we want to have a, a criminal justice network, which is not inward looking, but is outward looking and other people will be keen to join and do new things with. Our sign off line is that ideas and people are the things that will change the systems. And we hope that this is a way of bringing ideas and people together. So, uh, as I see uh, now 11 cheerful faces, can I say thank you very much indeed, and we shall sign off with a thank you. Thank you. And thank you.